And I'm Amelia Vance with the Future of Privacy Forum. And we are now going to kick off our panel on regulating companies. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, more than half of the 40 plus states that have enacted new student privacy laws in the past eight years include components that directly regulate education technology companies. There are a lot of lessons learned from these state laws that can inform a federal approach, especially as federal regulators and policymakers look towards developing comprehensive student privacy protections. Amid increasing concerns that student data is improperly being shared with third parties and that schools are ill-equipped to implement appropriate privacy protections, these lessons learned are not just from the company's perspective, but also the parent and school administrator perspective. Uh, we welcome fabulous panelists that can share the challenges and successes they've encountered while approaching student privacy. So I'm going to have people go ahead and introduce themselves. We'll start with Lynette. Thank you, Amelia. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Lynetta Tai. I'm president of Playwell. Uh, it's a privacy compliance consulting organization, global in scope, but with a special focus on education and youth data privacy. Um, I am also project director for COSIN's Privacy Initiative and Trusted Learning Environment Programs. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. Ariel. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, great to see you, Amelia, and other panelists. I'm Senior Counsel for Global Policy at Common Sense Media. Common Sense is committed to helping uh, families and educators thrive in an increasingly digital world and um, focus a lot of time on legislative updates and trying to get companies to do better. Fantastic, Andy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, letting me come and join the party. Um, I am the VP of and private, Chief Privacy Officer at McGraw-Hill, and I have been in the privacy space for well over a decade and working on privacy at McGraw-Hill for eight years. Fantastic. Last but not least, Alan. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Meadham. I'm the Executive Director for uh, Technology for the North Shore School District. Uh, and also, well, at least for for now, for those in school districts, I've reached my 30 anniversary, 30th year anniversary in North Shore, which is crazy. Um, so I'm figuring out what's next. I don't know. Maybe I'll keep doing this. Anyways, I'm also the uh, I'm also on the management board for the Student Data Privacy Consortium, which was referenced uh, a little earlier. Fantastic. All right, let's dive in. We're going to go into some weeds here. So, uh, Ariel, starting with you, Common Sense was a lead drafter back in 2014 of the Student Online Personal Information Protection Act, so PIPA, the landmark California student privacy law that really changed the student privacy legal landscape um, with now 30 states about that have enacted a version of this law. What drove the process uh, behind drafting and introducing SOPIPA, and should SOPIPA inform a federal approach? Thanks, Amelia. Yeah, it feels like uh, just yesterday, but now I guess seven or eight years. So at Common Sense, we work with a lot of educators and a lot of teachers and schools, and it seemed like they were already overburdened. It didn't seem fair to put the burden on them to make sure that companies were appropriately protecting uh, student data uh, via contract or otherwise, uh, particularly when the companies themselves were usually the ones whose tools were collecting the data or it was you know, being held in their databases. So, so PIPA was, was the first law that directly put the onus and the burden and the responsibility on the companies, um, whether or not they had a contract with the schools. Because we also saw that many uh, teachers were just using apps and things they would find and not necessarily going through a school contracting process, whether or not that was the approved approach. Um, we thought it was important with SOPIPA that, that personal information and data be defined really broadly, since it's so easy to connect different pieces of information with students nowadays. Um, and we also knew that in the student privacy space, uh, what I think of as sort of the fiction of notice and consent in the consumer space, it becomes fantasy in the, in the education space. 
um, parents are not really giving informed consent to additional and commercial uses of their kids' educational information. Uh, they just want their kids to be learning and so are trying to ensure that that happens. So we wanted there to be real safeguards from the get-go, prohibitions on selling student personal information, prohibitions on targeted ads and profiling, and not something that a parent could kind of be pushed pushed around to accidentally consent to. Uh, as as uh, you know, spearheading folks on SOPIPA, we definitely think it should inform a federal approach, which I think we'll talk about a little later. Um, it has in the past with bipartisan bills in both the House and the Senate. And I think it informs you know, the most recent discussion draft from Representative Trahan as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Lynette, what are your thoughts on SOPIPA's impact and whether and how it should inform a federal approach? It's been it's been terribly impactful, as as we know. It's been imitated very widely, and and with I think um, I think good intention and good results, um, and and some degree of consistency, which has been helpful. It's been certainly expanded on in a number of states. Um, a number of states have done some work, I think, to clarify and uh, address some uh, potential ambiguities in drafting. Um, and so, uh, and, and it's, I think it's been really helpful in enforcing some existing FERPA and other federal law requirements and prohibitions. So I think in, in both in terms of the spread and the um, influence it's had in, in raising awareness around the privacy requirements, it's been a bit of a game changer, which has been um, very interesting to watch and, and I think you know, is one of the things that brings us all to the table here today, right? We're all now focused keenly on student data privacy. The question of whether or not it should be a federal model is an interesting one. Um, there are other models out there, but but clearly SOPIPA has been incredibly popular. Um, I think if it, if it is uh, used as a baseline for a federal model, I'd like to see it elevated. Um, I think, you know, again, speaking to, you know, definitional ambiguity, inherent conflicts that we see in some of the imitators, in some of the laws that have come forth as a result, I think really important that there's an opportunity here to be, bring better clarity, right? And I, and I think that companies certainly wrestle, and I think districts do too, with implementing you know, many of the laws that exist, right? We don't have implementation guidance. We don't have enforcement yet. So we don't really know um, how any of these areas of gray, if you will, um, and those devils are in the details, would be interpreted. And so I think whatever a federal model becomes, and I think SIPIPA is a solid model, um, it'd be really important to focus on the spef specifics and to not end up in a situation where we are looking at you know, 140 student data privacy laws, 150 student data privacy laws, and still having this conversation. So I think the first question is not what is the model, but what is the purpose, what is the goal of federal student data privacy law that's not already been achieved by the 130 plus state privacy laws out there, plus the federal laws. And let's focus in on that, right? I think, I think we start with the question of have we improved the student data privacy climate over the past six, seven years as these laws have come out. And I think we would all argue that in some way, we, we certainly have, certainly awareness is much higher. Um, so where's the gap? And let's, let's focus in on that. Because I think certainly for companies, what we would want out of our law is the ability to implement with some confidence. Absolutely. So as mentioned, just now by Lynette, uh, we have these, you know, 130 plus laws, uh, over 40 states that have enacted all of those laws, and many are directly regulating companies. Uh, Andy, what are some of the common challenges that companies face with regard to complying with varying state by state student privacy laws and ed tech uh, requirements? Oh, I think you're muted. Always happens to one person, right? Um, so thank you, Amelia. And you know, I first want to focus on SIPIPA and say that it, it really is the gold standard in my mind. We sent a letter of support in when it was going through the process. And I, I would like to see that be the federal standard, but uh, that gets into the issue of preemption and all that stuff. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, it, it really is an issue for companies with 130 some different state laws 
Uh, rather than being able to focus on implementation, I spend a part of my time keeping up with these laws. For example, some of the laws have very specific language that has to be in their contract with vendors. Um, and it's always very different from what the other laws say. So we end up with a page on our website that we use and say, okay, if you're in New Jersey, here's this. If you're in Connecticut, here's this. And it just makes the process cumbersome. And we spend a lot of time just tracking those requirements and keeping up with it that I'd prefer to spend on other parts of privacy. Um, it really does become a resource issue. Uh, I think it's great because the states are filling in the holes that as, as the previous panel talked about, FERPA hasn't been updated. So there are holes in, in how we've changed. And I, I think that having a law that, that fills those holes is important. I, I tend to compare HIPAA a lot to education or, or vice versa. Uh, I think that you have the US or HHS enforcing HIPAA across the country. Why don't we have a strong student education law that the Department of Education is enforcing like they, they do technically for FERPA? I think that education is a very complex environment, I think, as everyone agrees, with the vendors, uh, LEAs, SEAs, parents, everyone involved. And I think that the more we can contain that knowledge for enforcement in one place, the better enforcement we'll have. Um, I may have jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but um, it, the point being, it is very hard for companies. It is a resource drain when we could be spending those resources on more training for staff, on uh, better training developers. Like not, not that we don't train them, but you know, it's one of those things, the more, the more you train people, as they were saying in the first uh, session, the better they get it. So I, I, to me, the big thing is it's really just a resource training. Thank you, Andy. Um, Alan, from a district perspective, what challenges um, do you face with ensuring that company practices are in line with uh, state and federal student privacy laws and just privacy best practices? Yeah, uh, first of all, excuse me if I'm looking down, I've, um, I've got some notes here and I know that can look odd on camera. Uh, I also want to mention a couple of things. One, so Pippa, total game changer, right? I mean, huge to have the weight of uh, of that legislation for those of us out in the hinterlands of Washington to be able to refer to, and we appreciate that. Um, and I would say things are better, right? But it's a little bit of uh, ignorance was bliss for some folks before where things are better, but now it's almost like you realize how far you're away from being perfect now. So it's, it's like it's better and worse at the same time, which I, especially people in the district you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I would say some of the, some of the big challenges are um, uh, education and knowledge of people's obligations at the district level is such a challenge. It's, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I've talked to everybody on the planet at this point about privacy, and yet every year we have new people who they don't know what the responsibilities are, right? I mean, they want to do the right things, but they don't, they literally do not know what it what the right thing is at this point. Um, I would say pressure from our peers, both in the district and from uh, administrators, uh, teachers, other folks to, you know, hurry, 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 get things approved and get things pushed through and hearing, you know, from vendors and from kids at the, or not kids, but teachers at the district. Well, the district right next door to us is letting us use this software. Why can't I? And you know, if every other district in the state is using this software, they must be right, right? And having to say, well, you know, unfortunately, every people still click and agree to things. And so we do have different obligations. So that's enormous pressure. I would say pressure from vendors. Um, you know, there's a, that is getting better and better and better, but there's still a lot of vendors who um, uh, want us to just agree and move forward on some of these on some of these things that's uh which is problematic lack of resources at the district level 
Um, Washington has, the state of Washington has 295 school districts. I could probably name you the five who have an attorney on staff. And I don't think any of them are versed in student data privacy issues, right? That's not the reason districts hire attorneys. So um, I end up negotiating these contracts. I am immensely unqualified for that job, but immensely more qualified than most uh, people in my position. And I don't think I'm being um, uh, a braggart when I, when I say that. I just, I've done a ton of this stuff and I just know enough to know holy crap, I shouldn't be doing this. Somebody else should be doing this work. Um, I, and, and then I've got a day job, right? There's nothing in my job description that says I'm going to negotiate these contracts and work back and forth and uh, sit on boards like SDPC, do these kind of conversations. I mean, I'm a technology director and a former high school math teacher. I, I'm not entirely sure how I got this job in the first place, but that's one of the pressures on districts is all my peers are in the same position. I would say expectation from parents that we are going to be more restrictive and more protective of their students. Uh, that's an enormous pressure. I mean, I have to talk on the phone with parents who have real concerns about these things. And in some cases, I don't have great answers for them. Um, I would say uh, expediency. Expedient, I'll, and I'll stop there because I know we have to go on. I'll say expediency is always the hobgoblin at schools. It's everything has to happen so fast, right? I mean, teachers who, who it's critical, and it really is critical to their curriculum that they be able to use a piece of software tomorrow. And I open it up and I look at this thing and it's just, you get crestfallen and you think, oh my God, you know, this software is never going to be compliant. These, or, or it'll be a product where these guys don't even have a privacy policy. I mean, how do we get to 2021? and they don't even have a privacy policy on their website. And I know 175 districts across the country are using this product. And now it's just, you just, I mean, sometimes you just gotta close your email and say, I cannot deal with this today. This will have to be tomorrow's task. Um, well, that was doom and gloom. There you go. <laughs> it's okay, it's realistic here. Um, Lynette, do you have anything to add? I, you know, I would certainly just from my experience um, talking with districts and, and partnering with districts um, would echo a, a lot of what Alan has said. It's, it's universal across the country. Districts are, are really struggling. These laws are put in place with, with good reason and good intentions, but they're unfunded mandates. And we cannot stress that enough that for a district to be asked to do what they're asked to do in these laws, hire a data steward, hire a CPO, hire a champion, um, let alone have counsel at the ready, like that experience of only having maybe five lawyers in the state um, dealing with, you know, helping districts, um, the, the, the job of negotiating contracts and data protection agreements with companies is we find often falling to the CTO or the IT director and they don't all have Alan. Um, and so it is a, a very, um, uh, insecure position for people to be in and there's overwhelm and there's no training and there's no implementation guidance. We cannot stress that enough that when we think about what's needed, if we have a new federal law, right? We need guidance, we need implementation regulations. We know what the laws require. We know what the boundaries are of good, proper privacy forward use of student data. Um, we need to know what the expectations are with clarity and we need districts to get the resources they need to make it happen. Great, thank you. Um, Ariel, Andy, do you wanna mention anything else there? I would just add or repeat actually that um, it, I, if I have resources, then that's bad, but school districts are absolutely worse off from a resource perspective than we are. Um, I think that if they're, I would love to see, and maybe it's pie in the sky, but I would really love to see a federal bill that requires chief privacy officers, officers like Whitney, at least on the state level, and then funds that requirement to help the school districts get what they need, like what Utah is getting from Whitney. I think we'll never get there 
unless we actually operationalize these requirements. And right now, like they were saying in the previous session, we're making these requirements, but we're not really making it. Actually, you might've said it earlier, Amelia. Um, we're, not, we're not giving people the ability to actually do them. So, yeah. So obviously, you know, COVID-19 has changed many things um, and shown uh, a brighter spotlight on uh, ed tech and student data. From each of your perspectives, what important issues or regulatory gaps have come to light? And Ariel, kicking things off with you. Sure. Well, first, even though it's not exactly student privacy, my colleagues would never forgive me if I didn't mention that the gaps in high-speed internet connectivity that have been exposed that I'm sure all of us have been complaining about for years, that's, that's a huge problem and we're starting to get some funding for it, but we, we still need more. Um, second and more pertinent to this, I think, is how the differences between ed tech and consumer tech are much smaller than we might have thought. Um, schools and teachers are using products that have not been designed for classrooms um, and or for learning purposes or for children. Uh, and so this really highlights to me, as someone who works on a lot of legislation, that we need to ensure that we are covering all products, not just those you know, designed for and marketed to K to 12 schools. We need to cover the products that are actually being used by schools and with students. And that has been a shortcoming looking back from our perspective at SOPIPA in terms of who it, who it covers. And that's something that I think we really need to fix because I think we're just gonna see more and more overlap of schools wanting to use some new product that's been developed for the consumer market. Um, and then that product not really having thought about the fact that they have you know now 110 year olds using their service. Thank you so much. Um, Alan, mm -hmm. oh, how has COVID-19 shifted <laughs> things yeah. for you? No, no, just same old, same old. You know, Amelia, no difference. Um, yeah, one or two things. I would say one of the big deals was, um, understandably, people adopted a Wild West sort of mentality when we went uh, to remote learning, right? I mean, we were we were shuffling computers out of our classrooms and into kids' homes just as fast as we could, and people were just scrambling. And that led to, understandably again, uh, an idea that we just need to do whatever we can to get kids to continue to learn, and we understood that. But I would say as time went on, uh, that mentality has persisted. So we had done a lot of work to educate people on the idea that you really need to get these things approved and reviewed before kids could use them, then we kind of unleashed things and now getting everything back together has been a, a real challenge. I'd say um, one, of the, one of the bright lights a little bit in this, it really is exposing what kids are doing and what software they're using to parents. I mean, more parents looking over a kid's shoulder and seeing what kids are doing, both the effectiveness of the software. Um, you know, does, is this actually helpful? Is the kid actually learning more about math or reading or anything from this particular software? Uh, that's been exposed, but also the more parent interest in what kind of data is being collected about my kid and why is this piece of software asking for the parent's name and email address. And what's the reason for that? Um, we've had a lot more of those kind of questions. So I like to think, think of things as more blessing and curses a little bit. And there, there's, been, uh, there, there's, been a, a, there's been a bit of both, um, but I think exposure to parents has been a big, big deal. Not to mention, as Ariel mentioned earlier, just the, 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 uh, the bleak state of home internet access for kids in some cases. Oh, and related to that, our inability to control a family's network, right? I mean, that was gigantic. We can't block things now. Um, and more kids using their personal device. Now I really can't control anything. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, Lynette, what issues or regulatory gaps uh, came to light in your view? 
Well, on the, on the privacy side, I think we saw, and I would just echo a bit what, what Ariel was pointing to, I think we saw um, companies in, in sort of the general audience market um, marketing their services in education. And I think that if you are an organization and you are designing or marketing your product for K-12, you have an inherent responsibility to understand the matrix of requirements and the um, the special protections that you need to put in place around your um, privacy practices, around your data handling, use sharing. Um, there's there's really you know, no excuse in this day and age to not understand that you're walking into a heavily regulated sector and you need to behave appropriately. So I think we did service some of that. And I think we also saw companies that, you know, really went in, um, I think we saw we saw both those who misstepped in that arena and those who came in uh, and really tried to um, to provide help and support and really kind of rose to the occasion. Um, and so I think there was it was a you know a mixed bag. Um, I'm I'm not sure uh, that I see a clear regulatory um, need coming out of that, but I certainly see that we um, there were some friction points that were highlighted. And to Alan's point, you know, the, the sort of tried and true governance challenge in, in districts around educators bringing technology in and the vetting processes, um, that just that was just exacerbated because of the, the desperate need at the time to solve a problem quickly. And Andy, uh, what uh, spotlight was shown for you related to privacy in COVID? So uh, my first statement, and I don't want to sound like a jackass, but I might anyway. We've been around for a long time. I've had a privacy program there at McGraw-Hill for a long time. It wasn't a privacy issue for us. It was getting thousands upon thousands, tens of thousand educators trained as they moved from textbooks to digital. We've this Because of the last year, we've become primarily a digital company across the board. And, and it was very different before that. People knew us for our textbooks. Um, our, our digital was growing, but there were a lot of teachers who needed to understand how to use the platforms and how to do it securely. And we just spent a lot of time, literally thousands of sessions with educators showing them how to use our systems. And that, and that was really the heavy lift for us, um, supporting our customers. Yeah, I think it is similarly, I've heard from both districts uh, and from companies uh, related to COVID, if they had a system in place, if they had that, you know, privacy officer or a person who at least has privacy as part of their job, um, things weren't easy for the past year and a half, um, but they were easier, it sounds like, than for some of their peers. So... Just last week, uh, Congresswoman Trahan introduced a discussion draft of a student privacy bill that would regulate ed tech companies at the federal level, taking a lot of language from uh, the SOPIPA models we've seen. Um, the bill includes aspects such as, you know, the prohibitions on targeted advertising and profiling, but also includes some novel elements, including private right of action and a technology impact assessment requirement. Have you guys had a chance to review the bill? And if so, any initial thoughts um, on its approach? And for anyone, um, we're going to drop a link uh, into chat. Um, this is a discussion draft that is currently open for comments um, by anyone uh, by October 31st. Um, so we will make sure to put that there. Um, who would like I'll, to start? Alan. I'll jump yeah. in just real quick and say the, the effectiveness piece is I'm, I, I have no idea how we're going to measure that, but I know we should be measuring it. And I'm super excited to see what's going to come out of that. Um, I'll just say that first. Great. And I can speak, I think we're already publicly uh, on the record as being supportive of the ideas in the discussion draft, which, as you mentioned, uh, pull a lot from SOPIPA. Uh, 
Also really supportive of the process that Representative Trahan is taking. You know, anyone can go online and they're inviting feedback and comments, which is not something you always get with federal legislation, especially if you're, you know, a parent or an educator. And I think she wants to hold, um, you know, meetings and other discussions um, with folks in, in Massachusetts. So I think that's excellent. Um, one of the things that I like in here, though, that I, after this discussion really reminds me, I'm gonna maybe file a comment to just be even stronger, is that there's a requirement for the Secretary of Education to provide uh, guidance and technical assistance to, to schools about responding to security breaches. Really, that should be maybe ideally even broader, and there should be guidance about privacy and technology and training in general, and maybe some way for them to take some of the resource burden off of the schools. Uh, but I think this is a great approach and it has strong prohibitions and it also acknowledges that technology is here and how, how can we make the best of it and how can we help it help students? I'll, I'll take it. Oh, do you want to go ahead, Lynette? Go ahead, right, Andy. Take, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, for those of, know, those of you who know me, I like to think that I'm funny. So my first comment is actually that privacy people love acronyms. So I want to officially coin the, the uh, acronym TIA for the Technology Impact Assessments on the first person to say it. Probably not, but um, I, I love the bill. Um, I, I think there are some changes that could be made, and I honestly had not heard of um, Congresswoman Trahan before, but now she's uh, one of my favorites. Um, I, I think it's really important to get something like this out there to, to cover us across the U.S. states. Again, I, I reiterate what I said before and that I think the U.S. Department of Education should be the regulator. They should be the one who's putting out the, the guidance and the requirements. They know the education space. Not to dismiss anyone's knowledge at the FTC, but um, this is not a consumer privacy issue. This is a student privacy issue. And I think the um, US Department of Education has, has more background on that. Um, I love the idea of the TIAs. Um, as I said, I would like to, I would like to see much like um, Trahan's doing with the actual draft of this bill, uh, whoever ends up being the regulator doing the same thing when it comes down to how do we put these various pieces together? Because I've found over the years that not everyone really understands the education environment. For example, you know, parts of this bill say that parents should be able to make requests directly to vendors. I don't know parents. I can't confirm who they are. I don't have parent data. I have student data and the school owns it. So any request to me has to go through to school. We had that problem with CCPA in California, and, and we had to go talk to everyone to get someone finally fix it, and the attorney general did. But if that had gone through, then a parent could reach out to me and say, please delete my child's data. Now, there's some nuances there and all that stuff, but it, it presents something that doesn't work. Um, so it, it's really important that all of those requests, changes from parents go through the institution. Um, one final sort of note, um, it seems odd to me, and it's been this way for since student privacy laws started uh, six, seven years ago, but there always seems to be an exception for nonprofits or for assessment providers. Why? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. They have student data. Why are they not responsible for taking care of it? Holy smokes, Andy, I totally agree. It kills me, right? I mean, and I'll just, you guys know, I'm just going to go ahead and say, University of Washington does that to us all the time, right? Because they're from a university, they're a nonprofit or blah, 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 whatever the heck they are. And our teachers willingly turn over information to them that they get shielded. It just drives me absolutely nuts. And um, we're powerless. Yeah, and I think, um, so the Trahan bill, as, as with many others that have come and gone at the federal level, does attempt to, um, to loop in nonprofits. And I think, um, you know, to, to just elaborate on the challenge there, part of the challenge is that 
the FTC does not regulate nonprofits. Um, and most of the state student data privacy laws that impact companies are enforced under the state's business and professions codes. So um, again, we're in the area of commerce, not always nonprofit. And so it's more of a just function of the structure in which the laws are created and the regulatory authorities rather than an exception for that kind of data. Um, but it is, a, it is a very real challenge. Um, I'm not going to sort of elaborate on the kudos that have been given to, um, to Trahan and the bill. I, I think it's, um, I, I do love the approach, absolutely. I think it has um, some solid pieces. I do think the areas of, uh, of, of where, where some adjustment is needed. I think the, the, the TIA, as Andy um, would like to, to, to name it, um, I think it's an interesting concept. I think it's an important concept. I think it's something companies should absolutely be doing and something many companies do. Um, I think GDPR has a nice model for a privacy impact assessment that might be more um, instructive here. I think that as drafted, this could have an incredibly chilling impact on all the small do good companies that the bill is probably not directly aimed at and be very beneficial to those who can afford to do what's being asked to do in this bill. And so I think that's really important. I also think the, um, the way the bill sort of requires companies to reach outside themselves um, is a little bit tricky in implementation. And so I think there's some conversation that, that should probably happen there to ensure that everything ends up legal in the bill, um, right? We don't want, um, one of the things that has been very challenging about student data privacy laws and CC consumer privacy laws is we wanna make sure that what we end up with is enforceable um, and isn't going to fall apart upon challenge. And so I think that, and I think the, um, the question about the private right of action um, around a privacy harm is particularly interesting and probably needs some discussion in the context of a bill that would treat a student name being released, right? Yearbook information being released as a breach. And so is that a privacy harm um, that is actionable? Again, you know, looking at, are we, are we trying to make class action attorneys wealthy or are we going to properly protect student data privacy and focus on things that we can properly control? I think to Andy's earlier point, let's do the work and not have to focus so much on navigating through um, legal complexities that put companies on the defensive for reasons that don't actually do more to protect student data privacy. I think there's a balance there. And I think, it's, um, I think there's some interesting ideas here that I think will likely get sorted out into something very beneficial and workable. Yeah, I, I, I would just add to that, sorry, Amelia. Um, I, I think the private right of action, while understandable, if you just look at it from 10,000 feet, becomes very difficult up front. And all it's going to do is create a cottage industry for um, lawyers to, to make uh, class action lawsuits, honestly. Um, I do think there should be enforcement, obviously. Um, there should be penalties, there should be fines. But it is very difficult to prove individual harm from any sort of data breach. And it, let's say you had two breaches of someone's information, uh, or one breach of someone's information, or two breach, yeah, sorry, two breaches of someone's information at the same time. How do you decide who is responsible for the harm? It's likely not both of them. And that's why most court cases, when companies get sued for data breaches, it, it goes nowhere because there's no proof of harm. So I, I think it just introduces a, some complexity that's not needed. I, I certainly believe in enforcement and fines and penalties, but um, I, I don't think that's the way to go. Throwing a question out there that no one has prepared for just for fun. Um, when we're talking about enforcement, what might be effective? What are some of the options that we've seen in other laws um, or have been introduced that um, could, you know, provide sort of the stick part of carrot and stick when it comes to making sure that um, companies are doing the right thing when it comes to student privacy? 
I think that um, companies coming into the space and don't feel that the threat of not having access to student data for a period of at least five years, um, uh, the threat of um, financial and injunctive penalties, debarment in certain states. Um, if they don't feel that, then I'm not sure what they're going to feel. But um, I do think that when we look at laws like COPPA, like GDPR even, um, when we look at how regulations are enforced, um, that from my perspective tends to be what matters most. Companies sit up and take notice when regulators take action, um, when they put a shot across the bow of industry, when they write a settlement statement that demonstrates where they are interested, what they are finding is problematic. Companies sit up and take notice and pour over those things um, and get into action around them, right? Let's make sure that's not gonna be us next because the second person who gets caught up in a similar action, it's going to be, the penalty will be typically more severe. So I think it's not necessarily about the penalty itself, although I think financial penalties and, and all of those tools in the toolbox are very important. And I think we see trends more towards, particularly in the AI space, um, revoking work product as well as data. Um, and, and I think there are a lot of very impactful in a chilling sort of way lessons to be learned from those settlements. And I think companies that are paying attention do. I think it what matters is, is having the penalty there and making it clear what you need to do to comply and then making sure that there is an, a regulatory agency behind it that does the work. So I just wanted to, you know, I, I guess I'm less concerned about a private rate of action because as much as we love SOPIPA, it hasn't actually been enforced in any public way. Um, and partly that's the definitional issue about who it covers, I think, but also partly it's that we have regulators right now that don't have any resources. And what I think doesn't work is having, you know, 40 people at the FTC and many thousands of COPPA violators or many, you know, millions of dollars for tech companies to spend on lawyers and probably less for some ed tech companies or many ed tech companies, obviously, and have a regulator try to enforce against that. So if we're not going to have, so you could have a private rate of action that's limited. Um, you could have a private rate of action that doesn't allow for, for class lawsuits. You could have no private rate of action, but a really well-funded you know, federal enforcer and also better funding for state attorney generals. I think we can be at, at common sense, we can be a little agnostic as to what the enforcement mechanism is, but it needs to be enough to be a deterrent and to be strong so that people feel like they need to take action. Uh, I think Ariel is, is, is absolutely spot on. There's got, there's got to be, there's got to be something, right? I mean, we, we see what the current environment is and we rely too much just on people doing the right thing, which, you know, fortunately in education, you track uh, both in the workforce and in the vendors, a lot of nice people who want to do the right thing. Um, but that's not a, that's, that's no security blanket. And I, sh and, you know, I also want to mention, I share Lynette's concern about how, what's the impact this is going to have on small um, vendors. And I get that they're going to be, they're going to struggle to be resourced, but um, I'll have empathy for them. But I just I can't have more vendors grabbing kid data without taking the responsibility of what that means. I mean, I'm a lot less concerned about what a vendor does with my data or a parent's data or a teacher's data than a kid's data. Uh, I think I've got the verbs all wrong there. I would get that screwed up on that. Um, but we need to treat that more seriously. And we need to we need to hold the people who collect this data more to account for what they do. And saying that, hey, I'm just a small company just getting started just does not fly with me anymore. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that at all, right? I think all companies, large, small, two people in a room making an app had better understand this ecosystem and comply to the letter and spirit, you know, to the end. Um, what I, what I, my note is really about the privacy impact assessment, the way it's written in the current bill, 
um, because if the if the intention is let's let everyone in the market except the Facebooks and Googles of the world survive and thrive, this is a pathway down there, right? And so we tend to write laws with specific sometimes targets in mind, and we tend to make it really easy for that target and for no one else. And that's my concern. I think everyone should be doing privacy impact assessments. I think there are ways to do them that make sense. And I do think the GDPR offers some instruction, um, some, some good examples to start with there. And that's my point. No, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I think if you're a one person making an app and you want it to be an education, buckle up and, and get it together. Yeah, Lynn, I did, I did not mean to imply anything other than that. I know, I'm, I'm right on board with you. Yes. Thank you. I was going to say, you know, just reiterating this, is, this is a discussion draft, very intent. They put this out as a draft for, I think a reason. And that was so they could talk to people and figure out ways to make it work. Um, it's not an introduced bill right now. So I, I, I'm sure they'll welcome all this feedback. And I do think the approach is fantastic. And I think that to points that have been made, I think throughout the day, the most important thing from my perspective when writing legislation is what problem are we trying to solve? How are we going to measure the impact? And frankly, do we really understand education, education institutions and education technology companies? Because they're not monoliths. We don't all have, to Andy's point, access to teachers and parents and students to have these conversations, to do these things. And But we can still protect student data privacy quite well. We just need to write to the reality of the ecosystem. I, I, I think the... the the best thing about it to me, going back to SAPIPA, which was the first one to regulate vendors, is we're not where we were when FERPA happened. And, and the people who, I know that's been said a thousand times today, sorry. Um, people who have access, organizations that have access to that student data are now the businesses. And the other organizations that support education, whether it's managing the bus routes or the cafeteria lunch meals or, or whatever it is there's an entire network um and, and alan understands this better than me i'm sure but there's an entire network of vendors that school districts use for everything you could possibly imagine and if you're going to get into that space you you have to be ready for it like like lynette said buckle up now I think some of the things, like she said, and I'll just reiterate this, are certainly harder for small companies. I am so fortunate to work at a company where I'm 100% dedicated to privacy, but small companies don't have that. And their tools may be incredible, um, but it, it, you gotta, there's a balance there and I'm not, I'm not quite sure where you strike it, um, but I think it does need to get pulled back a little bit. So uh, I know we have about 10 minutes left. Please feel free to drop any questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, what are the most important considerations policymakers should take into account when approaching student privacy related legislation or regulations? So we starting with uh, Ariel here. Sure. Um, I think it is important that federal policymakers address this. Uh, it would help companies to have one really high standard, um, even you know higher than the current gold standard. Uh, and it's also really important that they make sure that they address the technology that kids and teachers and students are actually using, and that they provide you know address the technology today, but provide some room to grow. Um, I, I miss the FERPA panel, but I. It's almost 50 years old, right? Uh, COP has been able to hang in there a little better than most because we have rulemaking. So how are ways that we are going to keep up with technology? Because the one thing that we know for certain is that it's going to keep keep changing and keep being part of the classroom, whatever the classroom looks like next year and in five years. Great. I'll, I would, oh, oh, you go ahead. ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so I would... Uh, to me, the most important thing is doing what Trey Hand's doing once we get past the law and making sure that we talk to every stakeholder in the environment, because it is a complex environment. I've probably said that too much, but um, it, it's really important 
to understand how that data is being moved around. And I think legislators need to put the time into it to understand how it actually works. Um, the only thing I think I would add to that um, is that my train just derailed, so I forget. <laughs> so I'll let you go now, Alan. If I think of it, I'll uh, bring it back up. Okay. Um, I, I would say in addition to the things that have already been mentioned, from, from my perspective, um, the ability to actually implement whatever solution we have in, in place. Uh, I, I can't overstate uh, how, um, how dis disparate the, uh, the situation is at different districts on just knowing what's, what's required and what should be done. I mean, I actually, uh, I, I actually do lose sleep over thinking as I'm starting to think, like I mentioned earlier about like what's next for me and I leave North Shore is I lose sleep over, well, what's gonna happen? Because it, the, the, the ability for us to make this happen effectively for kids and parents at a school district should not depend on me sitting in this seat, right? But right now it does too much at districts around the country. And I mean, like I said, I won't be here much longer at, at this point. So what's going to happen? It can't depend on, on me sitting here. I would just add two things to what's already been said. One is um, understand the history of regulation in this space. And I think to a point that was raised in an earlier panel, look at the um, friction points between some of the existing federal laws. Uh, Amelia, as you know, we've been participating in joint FTC, Department of Education workshops on the pain points between COPPA and FERPA since 2017, and you know, continue to eagerly await um, any sort of work out of that, um, any of the promised guidance out of that. So guidance, implementing regs, that all really matters in having an impactful um, law. And lastly, um, keep the students' interest in mind, not just, not just privacy, but technology. Keep the interest of the teachers in mind to have a balanced classroom. Um, these, these, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where um, laws do not work in implementation when we have end up with fragmented education systems. So really learn from the past. There is a rich, rich history of laws that has been developed. And the more we can understand that in combination with the complexities of the ecosystems, I think the better we end up supporting the students. Great. Uh, so um, some audience questions, which I'm going to shift just a little to make them broad and, you know, do what I want them to do, taking moderator's privilege. Uh, so there was a question about the value of adding a chief privacy officer uh, in the state education agency and whether that could lead to supports with contract negotiation with vendors. Um, and would love maybe start with Alan and go around uh, what do we ideally hope that either state legislators or federal policymakers could do to build up the capacity uh, of state and local education agencies to do this work, to um, certainly have underlying protections and requirements that vendors have to meet, but that allows them to work on the many details that come up in interactions with vendors and others. So, uh, Alan, if you want to start there. Sure. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other good ideas here, but I would say the first place they've got to, first, I love the idea, but they've got to be properly resourced to be able to be successful, right? The idea of putting somebody in a position and not set them up for success is, it would, would, would not be useful at all. I, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's completely different in other states and Washington's an, an anomaly here, but um, at the state level, something as simple as, are you going to compensate these people to a place where people will stay in the position long enough to become effective? I mean, it's uh, in, 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 in Washington, like I said, I'm sure the to other states agencies are totally perfectly funded. Um, funding is so poor in some of these positions that 
people come through and leave in six months or nine months. It's a constant cycle. And we never get anybody in the positions who can really effectively do their job because they're constantly onboarding. And so nothing ever gets done because uh, we're in this constant austerity program, it seems like, from our legislators. Um, instead of being practical about things. The, if we hire somebody in this position, they're going to be a person with a skill set and options. We need to fund them that way. I, I would just add, um, I, I agree completely with what Alan said. I think it's very important to have chief privacy officers at all levels. What we're running into now is a global issue. We're a relatively new industry. When I first started, there were less than 5,000 people who had certifications in privacy from somewhere. Now that's 50, 60, 70,000, whatever the latest number is. There's a lack of privacy expertise globally. Um, it's not just in education, although I do think education, it's particularly sparse. I think I probably know most of the people who work on, on privacy education, and that's crazy. Um, I, I think we need to focus on that. I think we need to focus on expanding the talent pool and teaching people about privacy and how important it is. I, I think that, that that will get us to the point, because like what Alan said, what's going to happen is the second someone gets their foot in the door in a school district, then they'll move up to the state job then they'll move to a private company that will pay them more. And, and the state won't be stable and you have to be stable to build a program. It does not happen overnight. I've, I've been doing it at McGraw Hill for eight years and I'm still changing things up. Like it, it, you have to have that consistency or you're not gonna get anywhere. Yeah, agreed. As, as someone who acts as a, a, a virtual chief privacy officer for, for many of my clients, um, it, it's, it's critical for, for districts to have that resource at the state level. Um, I, I think there is, at, at the district level, I think right now there is one district that has a chief privacy officer role. Um, and that is just, that's crazy. Um, and it is all falling on the hands of the IT director, or the technology director, the CTO, to be the technology person, the security person, the privacy person. These are all different skill sets there. And there it's three jobs. Um, at least. So, um, you know, starting it at the state level with someone who's got the expertise, the experience, to Alan's point, you know, has the incentive to, to really do that work and stick around long enough to make a difference is going to be critical. And that comes down to resource and investment, right, for legislators who are writing these laws. Um, you know, before you put pen to paper, how are you going to make it happen and, and really understand what it, what it takes and build that in? That will go a long way towards encouraging um, the elevation of, of privacy uh, across the community. All right, so we're in our last minute. And so we're going to do rapid response. What is the number one thing that you want to tell a policymaker to do next? Ariel. Uh, make the protections default and unchangeable. So parents need to worry and spend no time that they don't have on them. There you go. Alan. Um, education and communication. I stole, I did two things, right? People need to know what's going on and they need to be told about it. Lynette. Understand what you're writing about before you write about it. <laughs> and the last word, Andy. Oh, Lynette took mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, other than that, I, I would say, um, we need a law that's sturdy and protects the industry. The most important thing for all of us is improving learning outcomes for students. That's what we need to do, but we need to protect that data in, in the process. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to this fabulous group of experts. Really appreciate your time today. I am now going to hand things over to my colleague, Anisha Reddy, who will moderate our last panel.